Thank you, Josh. Uh, this is a joint work with Brother Gregor from the University of Kent, Shujia Salamayo Naik from the University of Pennsylvania. Our program analysis, as many of you might know, are algorithms that discover useful facts about programs. The state of the art relies on X for the writer's edits to define the analysis. And when Alice uh, writes the analysis, because of various reasons, she has to apply approximations. Let's say this analysis finds a program error to a box, and it is shipped to an end user, say Bob. When Bob applies this uh, analysis on his program, the approximations that Alice applied will inevitably result in false alarms. And when there are too many false positives, Bob will simply stop using the tool. And to counter this issue, writers like Alice in practice often apply various heuristics to suppress such uh, false alarms. Well, these uh, heuristics can be very effective in reducing uh, false positives. They often render the analysis ensemble. And this ensemble analysis result in false negatives on Bob's program, which are also very undesirable. So on one hand, we have a fully sound analysis, which produces a lot of uh, false positives. On the other hand, we have an ensemble analysis, which produces very few false positives, but comes with false negatives. So the question is, how we can combine the benefits of uh, both approaches without their drawbacks? Well, our observation is that, typically, these heuristics surprise the final uh, false alarms by, by surprising certain intermediate program analysis facts, which are the causes for these uh, false alarms. For example, uh, here is a heuristic that we took from code, a static diaries detector for Java programs. It says, for any data arrays that involves instructions in an object constructor, it is a false alarm. And internally, it translates to removing threaded shared effects which are related to instructions in an object constructor. Because intuitively, such instructions also operate on the object being constructed. And this object often stays uh, thread local until the constructor returns. So our idea is that instead of directly uh, applying such heuristic to remove its uh, root causes, we're going to pose uh, each root cause as a question to Bob. Only if Bob confirms the a root cause root, a root cause to be spurious, we will uh, surprise the corresponding false alarms. So you might be asking, are we actually putting more burden on the user? Because now the user also has to inspect the intermediate results of the analysis. Well, this concern is resolved by an observation called generalization. The idea is that in almost any program analysis, most of the false alarms are simple theorems of very few common causes. And asking the users to Bob to inspect these very few common causes will be cheaper than inspecting the final alarms. The next question is that how should we pose these uh, uh, causes as questions to the user? Well, this leads to our second observation, which is called characterization. The idea is that uh, different set of questions can resolve different number of alarms in the analysis. So they come with different payoffs. And ideally, we want to first ask users about the questions with higher payoffs. And we want to do it in an iterative way. There are two benefits about that. First of all, by prioritizing the questions with higher payoffs, the user can get most of the benefits of our approach early on. I can stop in direction whenever the benefit diminishes. And secondly, uh, by asking these questions in an iterative manner, we can uh, take consider we can take in account the information provided by user on the fly, and make the way we find such questions smarter. So, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to use uh, static data detection as an example to explain how approach works. Uh, here I have a highly simplified uh, FTE solar program. So this is just for elaboration. In the paper, we have a much more advanced example that is extracted from the Apache FTP server program. So the main function of the server class uh, iteratively handles uh, incoming FTP requests 
by creating a handle object. The handle object only has uh, two fields, a password field and a data field. And the constructor of the uh, class, which is in from 9.6, fills these two fields with information read from the socket. Then it starts a new thread for to process the uh, connection. The run method first checks whether the password matches the uh, stored password. If yes, then it proceeds to process the actual data. Because the password field is a certain information, the main thread sets the field to now at 918. So this program has a harmful data rate between 918 and 922 on the password field. And this data rate is between the main thread and the new thread. And we are going to capture this uh, uh, data rate using the following, following analysis expressed in dialog. So dialog is a declarative language which is very popular for specifying program analysis nowadays. And this analysis is very simple. It only has two rules. The first rule says, uh, if program point PC accesses object O, and O is a thread shared object, then PC accesses thread shared memory locations. The second rule says, if both program points PC1 and PC2 accept thread shared memory locations, and then they accept the same memory locations, then there's their race between them. Uh, so here we have a uh, uh, Context and flow incentive there is analysis. But in the paper, we apply our approach to a fully context and alternative analysis that we extracted from code. So if we apply this uh, uh, analysis, we'll, ha have, uh, we'll have the following division graph which explains how the analysis works. So each node in the graph either represents an input tuple or a derived tuple. And each edge is an instance of a root, for example, the edge from escape 3 to shell 15 is an instance of the first rule. And the edge from shell 15, shell 22, to uh, race 1522 is an instance of the second rule. Here we elide the uh, uh, relations including uh, access and the edges for integration purpose. As we can see, this analysis successful, successfully captures the real data race. But at the same time, it also derives eight false alarms. So let's see why these alarms are derived. So we're just going to look at race 15 and 22 as an example. This is a false alarm because the handle object only becomes shared by these multiple threads after line 17. But because we're applying a flow incentive analysis, the analysis thinks the object always escapes. So one way to remove such false alarms is to apply the aforementioned heuristic. And, but the problem is that if we directly apply this heuristic, the real alarm will also be inlated. So we will inlate shell 15, shell 18, and shell 16, these three intermediate tuples. But shell 18 is actually a valid tuple, as the object does become thread shield after 917. So our approach will pose such root causes as questions to the user. In the very first iteration of our approach, we will pick shell uh, 16 as the question and post to the user. It has a payoff of 4, which is defined by the number of resolved alarms divided by the number of questions asked to the user. Note here I only pick one question, one tube as a question, but in principle we can ask a set of questions in one iteration. For example, shell 15 and shell 16 is also a wide set of questions. But it has a lower payoff compared to the previous one. That's why I pick uh, shell 16 as the question. And this translates into the following text. Does line 16 accept any thread shared member location? If the answer is no, four false races will be inlated. Here we also display the expected payoff of the question. So the user can, can, just, can weigh the benefit and cost and decide whether to answer the question or not. Let's say the user confirms this uh, shell 16 to be spurious. This will help us resolve four false alarms. And in the next iteration, we'll pick uh, shell 15 as the question and ask to the user. Let's say this time the user confirms to be spurious again. And in the very last iteration, we only have one question left. And it has a payoff of two. At this point, 
Bob might decide to stop interaction because the payoff has dropped too low. He might just want to inspect the alarms himself manually. But let's say Bob decides to go ahead and inspect the uh, course anyway, and he finds shell 18 is actually a valid uh, two point. So he gave a yes to this uh, uh, question and uh, preserved the only real database. So in conclusion, by only asking the user two or three questions, depending on whether Bob decides to answer the last question, we are able to resolve seven out of eight false alarms. Moreover, we don't introduce any false negative. So the key challenge in our approach is how do we find a set of questions that maximizes the payoff? And we call this problem the optimal rule set problem. And we call a solution to this problem a rule set. And this problem turns out to be a combinatorial optimization problem. It is combinatorial because there are both conjunctions and disjunctions in the derivation. And what makes things worse is that it has a nonlinear objective. So this looks very hard. But luckily, uh, for any given analysis run, we only have finite numbers of uh, alarms and the potential causes. So we can just do a binary search on the payoff. And to do so, we reduce the problem into a sequence of 0, 1 integer linear programming problems. So I'm going to use the uh, second iteration of our approach as an example to explain how we encode the problem. So intuitively, each uh, LB problem asks the following question. Can we find the root set with a payoff which is not less than a given value? And we're going to introduce three variables for each tuple. The inth variable represents whether t, tuple t, is derived in the instrumental analysis. And the rig variable represents whether t will be derived based on the original rules. And finally, the small variables represent whether a tuple t is conformed by as spirits by the user. So let's look at the constraints. First, we are going to encode the assignments to the work variable. We'll assign the work variable to one if the tuple t is an input tuple, or it is a, a head tuple of any root instance whose body tuples are de uh, derived by the instrumental analysis. Here I'm using Boolean constraints to, for readability, but the standard ways convert them into linear constraints. We next uh, uh, write constraints for determining assignments to the uh, instant variable. Intuitively, this constraint is saying that for any uh, tuple, if it, if it should be derived based on the original rules, and it's not marked by the user as grids, we will derive this tuple in the instrumental analysis. Then we encode the uh, uh, tuples which are marked as grids by the user. We're going to as assign the small variables of tuples which are not targeted by the, by the heuristic as uh, zero because they'll be never asked as questions to the user. At this point, the user has confirmed the shared uh, 16 tuple spurious, so we will assign one to the corresponding small tuple. But at the same time, we leave a uh, uh, shared, small shared 15 and small shared 18 as unconstrained. And we will generate the final root set from the assignment to these two variables. And finally, we have a constraint which encode the payoff. So the, uh, the expression on the left-hand side represents the uh, sets of the, the number of uh, alarms expected to be resolved. And this expression expresses the size of the final rule set. So if we divide the uh, expression on the left-hand side with this expression, we will have the payoff. But there's a small issue about this uh, constraint. This constraint can be truly satisfied if this, uh, uh, two, both these two variables set to zero. So, so add an additional constraint to fix this problem. And finally, we have an objective which balances the, towards a smaller rule sets. So to evaluate our approach, we apply it to two analyses, a derivative analysis and a point analysis. So both analyses handle the full Java language, where one contains 30 rules, the other contains 76 rules. Uh, because the time is limited, I'm only going to talk about the uh, uh, first the so I'm going to talk about the, the first analysis, the analysis, Darius analysis. I will, I will apply the Darius analysis on eight real-world job programs. To obtain the ground truth of each tuple, we held uh, 44 professional job developers from uh, Upworks, a freelancer platform. 
and we ask them to label the label each tuple upfront. And because we run the experiment on the many settings, we use these uh, labels to simulate the role of the user in the interaction. And in terms of heuristics, which we use to identify the potential glucoses, we study three kinds. The first kind are purely static, and they're extracted from code. And the second kind, the heuristic dynamic. Uh, there are cases where we may not have good intuitions about which program facts might be spurious. In this case, we can use a dynamic analysis to infer likely environments. And last but not least, when we have uh, multiple heuristics, we have an uh, aggregated one, which combine them together using a decision tree. And this turned out to be the best heuristic that we apply in the main setting of our experiment. And we terminate the interaction between the user and the, our tool when the payoff drops to one, because at this point, there's no common root causes for the rest of the alarms. So we have implemented our, tool, uh, our approach in a tool called USA for any analysis specified in dialog. And USA uses uh, BDDBDB as a dialog solver, and Groovy as the integer linear program uh, solver. And USA has passed the artifact version, and we re release the source code online. So this uh, table shows the statistics of uh, the benchmarks. As we can see, the largest one uh, contains around 200,000 lines of code. And let's first look at the generalization result. We aim to answer two questions here. First of all, how effective is USA in resolving false alarms? Secondly, how many questions are asked to resolve this many uh, alarms? So this plot shows the percentage of false alarms resolved by USA in each benchmark. Uh, at the top, we have the absolute number of false alarms produced by the original uh, analysis. As we can see, on most of the benchmarks, USA is able to resolve, resolve almost all the uh, alarms. The only exceptions are HTC and WebPlug, where most of the alarms don't share common causes. On average, USA is able to resolve 74% of the false alarms. And to resolve these alarms, USA only asks a very few questions on each um, benchmark. As we can say, it's, it's only a fraction of the total number of false alarms. On average, USA achieves 12 times payoff for each uh, question. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, USA doesn't resolve all the alarms for each benchmarks because we stop interaction when the payoff drops to one. So let's, next, let's look at the uh, probabilization property, property result. So I think I'm slightly running out of time, so let's just look at this uh, blue line without uh, paying attention to this white line. So this blue line represents the number of questions asked and number of alarms resolved by USA in each duration. So there are two interesting observations. First of all, uh, in the very first situation, USA asks three questions to resolve around 300 alarms. So this shows that sometimes there are multiple ways to derive a false alarm. And we might need to ask multiple questions to resolve a lot of alarms. And secondly, as the interaction proceeds, the payoff gradually reduces. So this shows that USA is very effective in prioritizing the questions with higher payoffs. So, um, so here we have a result on one benchmark FTP. And on the other benchmarks, we get similar results. So to conclude my talk, first, we introduce a new approach for resolving static analysis of arms uh, by combining a fully sound by imprecise analysis with a, a unsound by precise heuristic via human interactions. And secondly, we propose the efficient algorithm that reduces the problem into a sequence of integer linear problem problems for a general class of constraint based analysis. And finally, we demonstrate the effectiveness of, of our approach and priority on side of real world programs. On average, we're able to eliminate 74% of false alarms with 12 uh, times scale for each question. Uh, thanks for attention, I'm ready to take questions now.